given the background and the area that I sort of <coughs> to look at, one of the concerns that I'd have when we look at South Africa and when we look at um, the structure of South Africa's prison population is that we have a, uh, a, a society that is reproducing systemic inequality and we do not have the interventions that will substantially and fundamentally change the life parts of people on the scale that needs to happen to completely change the way South African society is structured. And when I look at a policy document like the National Development Plan, um, I, uh, as an expert in a number of the areas in which they talk to, I know it is completely disconnected from South African society and will not solve its problems in a very fundamental way. And part of it comes from the quality of what we understand about what's going wrong in South Africa and the theories that we've developed. Um, if we had to look uh, at the context that we have in South Africa, we have one of the most unequal societies in the world. We are reproducing that inequality. The inequality is structural. Um, it is not just generated by the distribution of education. It's, it's generated by the prior distribution of income and a number of other features and subtle factors that affect the development of, of South African society. We also have uh, a society that is changing very rapidly. We have urbanization rates that are extremely high into areas like um, uh, in Pabalanga, Gauteng in particular, and the Western Cape, where the populations are changing by about 25% every 10 years. We don't really have a way in which we deal with the disrupted communities and families. We also have a society that has been affected substantially, not just by apartheid, but by the methods by which we have actually operated as an economy. Somebody who's earning an impoverished wage at a, at a mine, breaking up their family relationships, is now disconnected from a healthy way of developing as a family and as a, even interacting with business and, and developing their life path into the future. We don't understand the impacts that we've had of the way our economy has developed the way our social services are organized, the quality that, they, that we, we have. And one of the outcomes of that is the prison population that we have. So I'll focus on that particular area and, and sort of the intervention that I think would be quite useful. Um, the prison population, 55% of the prison population is there for violent crime. A lot of them might not be uh, uh, correctly convicted. Those are the convicted criminals. We have a, a substantial increase in the length of sentences that are occurring in that environment. And our solutions are not going to come from increasing sentences, more police, more uh, 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 um, uh, 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 courts, etc. It's about actually looking at that outcome that we've got and saying, how, do we get, how are we getting this outcome? And how do we change it? And we actually don't know enough about how to prioritize our uh, social development uh, to stop what we're getting. So the intervention that I would suggest um, is that we actually use our current prison population as a method of data collection and information. I would propose we have say 120,000 uh, pr convicted prisoners at, at any point in time. Um, it would be most useful if every single one of them were given in-depth interviews on their entire life path, how they got to where they are, linking back into their communities throughout their life. Which communities did they come from? What affected their life path? What were their interactions with public services? What cri life crises occurred? And how did that affect the decisions and choices they made? There are people uh, who you can do in-depth interviews. And if you're interviewing 120,000, that's larger than the general household survey, which will provide us with nothing, no, system, no, no real systemic information on, on how, how the life paths that we're achieving. I propose that, in fact, the, this data is collected not by external researchers, but by research teams created out of prisoners within the system, <coughs> and that the database collection and collation, which is done on a continuous basis, is also done by people working in the prisons, and that the uploading of the information onto public websites is done by people who are managing the interface from the prisons themselves, making it available to researchers, and that they also research, do a lot of the research themselves on that. Now that information, connecting back to what's going wrong in communities, helps Public policy makers <coughs> work out what's going on where within society over a long period of time. 
and allows for the development of much more subtle and nuanced policies that can actually change what's going wrong in, uh, in society. And that information doesn't only tell you about that individual, but tells you about the communities and the families that they're in. It tells you which communities spatially are problematic, what transitions in society are causing major difficulties, and what has impacted on their life path. And I would suggest that the questionnaires, which are evolve over time, are developed by numerous uh, people working in, in uh, several different fields in conjunction with the people who would con conduct the interviews. But these interviews, because people are sitting there, uh, might be doing something, but they're not <coughs> necessarily being used very productively, can be up to two days for an individual. It, that kind of in-depth information is so valuable in determining policy and will, I think, materially change the way in which we make policy in South Africa instead of the crude assumptions and sweeping statements that we have in the NDP about what our problems and solutions really are. They really are so distant from solving anything that the current trajectory will do nothing but reproduce what we have at this point in time. But if we want the walls around uh, people to, to go down, and we want people the walls to go down around people in prisons, the, the issue is to understand exactly how they got there and what you might need to change to prevent uh, and completely change uh, the, the way in which society is organized. So that's my idea. <laughs> But for Alex, a, a serious question. I mean, what, what are the kinds of things you think one might learn from that kind of very <coughs> fabulous sounding research? And I would agree that there is a knowledge deficit, and we assume that we think, <coughs> we, we make a lot of assumptions. What, what would you imagine might be some of the things one could learn from a big investment in a research pro process like that? And how do you think that might change public policy? I mean, what what would be the benefit of, of undertaking that kind of learning? Well, I think the uh, firstly the the information shouldn't just be sort of random collection of information. It's sort of carefully thought through. The investment itself may not necessarily require a, a very substantial financial um, uh, uh, input, although uh, it, you know if you've got researchers who are working from, uh, who are offenders, then you want them to be paid for the work that they do as well, but um, and adequately compensated and training and they benefit from that. But I think that the information that you get is, is kind of, um, it shows you structural linkages in society because the problem that you have is that you've got many people who have different theories about what's wrong. And their theories about what's wrong in society uh, result in the kind of policies that get implemented. And if their theories are wrong, the policies are wrong. And they're misdirected and we reproduce inequality. And I, I would argue strongly that our policies are wrong. And that we're missing the target by miles in what we have to do. We've got people who are operating on the level of opinion making major strategic decisions about our social development in South Africa. And that has to stop. But you cannot, so very often the evidence required to, to target is, is very important. But other subtle linkages are that you get an idea of spatial problems. This village, this community, this area, and you know that perhaps if policymakers are now thinking creatively around this and have the information, they can say, well, clearly we, we need to think through how we deal with this particular village, this community. So not only the macro policy, but the micro interventions. There's a lot of problems here occurring. It's an educational system in that one. It's, the, it's, it's a combination of things in that. Let's have a, a complex intervention and really solve those problems. It raises the opportunity of just a much better thought through <coughs> set of interventions all over. How you get the information, and you know, from the question that was raised, I think is a is just a problem to solve. I'm not going to solve it here. I think that the opportunity exists, and the opportunity is that these the information in prisoners that they carry is immensely valuable. It's more valuable than any other information we're going to collect. We should be uh, uh, understanding how we how we get it into how we surface it. And, and if we do that, I think that even the ideas that one has about what one might do will themselves expand once you see the information.
but there's nothing like a life story and its detail to tell you exactly what's happening in a, in a very, very subtle and nuanced way. I, I think a huge amount of this research actually exists, which is quite an interesting thing. I mean, I think it is valuable research, but it does exist. There have been the, our prison um, population and others in the world have been extensively researched, and life story research is a very big part of that. Um, I also think that it's it's quite important that we don't say that it's the most important research, because it's just as important to know what works as what hasn't worked. And um, and I think there's a lot of that research too. So perhaps the the, the problem lies in the value of the research, the value that is placed on the research once it's delivered. Um, certainly, in my experience, a lot of this research doesn't actually see its way into properly developed into a proper logical stream where it delivers useful policy. Um, but you know, I think there there is there there is a lot known about these things. It's just that people aren't actually necessarily using it in the way that it should be. But that's where I'd say the point of the problem is. This is about prioritization. So the one advantage that you can get is not dipstick information of a few surveys here. What I'm talking about no, is dipstick. comprehensive, blanket, detailed information collated over time in which you're going into full life stories and the communities and you're linking it to structured processes of using that information to design policies in every single region and area in South Africa. Because everybody in that pr in the prison system comes from somewhere that is in dire need, <coughs> and what you're now understanding is a much more comprehensive picture. But any other research that is being generated is not going to the Department of Social Development to understand how to intervene in an area. We're not restructuring how our social workers operate. We're not working out what's failing in the basic education system in a particular area from such information. So to me, this is information that isn't just for prisons, it's about comprehensive policy development, and it becomes a source of information that should be mined like any other data source in any other environment where people are now operating with ideas of big data, but this is potentially richer and more structured than you'd get from, the, from conventional databases. Uh, so I'm saying we're in an information age, let's use the information age to solve really complex problems. By, um, by data production and data processing, but using the prison system and people within that environment to generate this information on a mass scale and then translate it for all sorts of use and research, but not leave it buried. So the whole idea is create the pipeline to everybody using it and accessing it and making sure that it is part of conventional public discourse. I'm Sasha from Just Attention International South Africa. Um, and I think in a way Barbara has, has kind of um, articulated what, what, what I was thinking. But I think, and maybe just to add on to that, um, that we do have a lot of life story explorations of people's paths into crime. And I mean, I, I think the huge problem around that has been getting um, take up of, of what we already know. So we already know a great deal about, for example, violence in the home in, in early years, the importance of early childhood <coughs> development, and there's still more research just about to be released on that. So I mean, I really like the idea of using inmates' wisdom, which I think both of, both of you are talking about. But I'm just wondering if this is the right place to invest. And I hear what you're saying about the um, the importance of understanding the complexity and differences regionally. But I think one of the huge challenges is <coughs> translating what we already know about the complexity into um, stuff that people can work with. So, so the translation of a deeply complex sort of social environment around w w which we already know a great deal about, but what does that mean for what we need to do to make it better? Um, and then just also the, I mean, uh, to pick up on what Miles said, the situation in prisons is, is so bad at the moment that to find a place to sit quietly with somebody, you know, to go through a life story. I would love to see us investing huge amounts in creating <coughs> the safety that would allow those conversations to take place. But I think that is perhaps where the, the primary investment goes, as well as looking at what we've already got.
Well, I mean, I, I would um, uh, argue that the, the, if, if one's already hitting a problem in how people use the information, and what I'm talking about is the systematic unit use of information across uh, all departments and all of government, where you're using information for policy making that people in the justice system aren't using. The other issue is I'm looking beyond how you solve the problem of why this person became a criminal. You're, this is a look through into, into complex communities and societies. And if you've got access to people for long periods of time, you can actually collect lots of <coughs> systematic information. So it's not just the collection of life stories. It's the collection of life stories and, uh, and information in a systematic way that allows for certain generalizations to be made, which you can't make just from a qualitative life story. So the, the issue is actually thinking very, I'm saying, use this as a strategic intervention which is to say that it is worthwhile collecting a, a, a large scale of this information so you can build up a number of pictures that is impossible with any other <coughs> data set that we have and tells us more about the prisoner but about the families and the rest in a way that tells us about their life paths as well as this one. But it, but it is about changing the life paths and if you do not have information that systematically connects, you don't know what to change. So is it about the social workers? Is it about the food in the school? Is it about the fact that people have inadequate incomes and therefore uh, choose lifestyles of desperate survival? What is the central cause? What do we need to change on a mass scale? What do we need to change on a micro scale? And when I say when we look at the top end of policy making in South Africa, we do not see people looking at this kind of information and systematic questions for the big policy recommendations they're making. And I'm saying that disconnect is dangerous for South Africa in the long term. And this kind of information is useful as a pointer for, uh, for getting us into a completely different way of thinking about our problems. Because we're not solving our problems. And I think that's the issue of the information we've collected to date and where we're going. We're solving nothing at this point. We're just reproducing the past. Good morning, you. Uh, my name is Aaron. Nazo. I'm from the Department of Community Safety and Accounting, the Provincial Secretariat. Uh, I, I was listening from the very first presenters, and the gentleman is a prince. He raised quite an interesting uh, thing. But let me talk to the two gentlemen. Uh, one, in the department, I think we, we could utilize particularly what uh, Alex is talking about. In, in one, we have a, a program that is in, at infantry stage called Crystals. Secondly, we have a program we call it a, a shock therapy, a prison talk, when, where we take the, the youth in conflict with the law uh, to prison as, 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 as a shock therapy. And I, I think getting deeper into your, your way of thinking and what you have already done can also assist us in shaping up those programs. We also have programs for community crime prevention initiatives that can benefit a lot from the kind of research that, that, that you, you are engaged in. For an example, when we, you develop your, your community safety plans for your community safety fora to, to implement looking at the challenges that are there. And once you, you thumb suck information, you end up with a program that will either hit or miss. But if we have uh, available type that information, that can then be properly channeled without tempering with the existing policies, but the kind of information that, that, that the kind of research you, you're talking about can, can present can better shape and also ensure that resources that are, are available are better utilized in addressing not the symptoms, but the root cause of challenges. 
And uh, we suppose from the environment that we are in, utilize intelligence from the networks that, that you're talking about in ensuring that we, we don't only arrest the runners, but deal with the, the kingpins, the big fish, and those kind of networks. But the, the thing that I think you, you need to skill us is to how do we then capacitate ourselves as officials in ensuring that we are able then to discharge the duties that, that, that we have and utilize the kind of information that is available. And how do you make that information available so that those that are the foot soldiers, so to say, and, and of, in, the, in the space that you're operating in, can better understand and comprehend the kind of information that is available and utilize those in uh, beefing up the programs that we are implementing for our communities. Uh, I thank you. Um, I think from, from, from what you just said at the end, my idea was to actually make sure that we, we bring in the law enforcement you know, agencies to actually come into these facilities and be able to interact and talk to these guys and share their experiences and make sure that all the information that they're getting they can use you know, for making sure that our communities are safe. I mean, just a comment on the, on the programs that exist. If, if, if I'm looking at ways to change sort of life pathways, I mean, you've got one where you're just trying to present people with alternative risk calculations, where you're saying, you know, don't commit crime because there's a risk you might end up like this. That doesn't point people in the direction of, uh, uh, of sort of a thriving sort of op opportunities in life. And, uh, and the, the question is, is that really, when we look at everything that we're presenting to people, we say, don't be criminals because you might end up like this, or are we saying, here is the opportunity and here we're giving or creating the, the basis or the platform for you to be something completely different and something really, really positive. Those people aren't even considering the risk calculation in what they're doing. They're not saying there's a choice between crime or this. Um, they're saying, I enjoy having a very positive life pathway. So the question is, why, how are we creating the conditions for that? And I'm saying we don't, we're not doing it at this point in time. We're not creating the conditions for the majority of the population to have a positive life path. Partly because we're, I mean, we've got haphazard, we've got programs that are going in in places. But are we doing them in a way that actually is going to systematically change the direction? I would say that it's a question as to whether or not we're getting the volume right of, the, of those to give people a completely different, different set of choices in life.